From KCRW Santa Monica and KCRW.com, this is The Treatment. Welcome to The Treatment. You can also hear the show at KCRW.com. If you're a lover of Groucho Marx, you should know about the book Raised Eyebrows, which Steve Stolyer published about his years working for Groucho for three years in the 70s. The book was published in 96. The 15th anniversary edition with a terrific new cover by Drew Friedman is published now. Steve, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, my thanks to you because I owe you a debt of gratitude to, as, a, as a boy, as a mere youth, slaving to make sure that Animal Crackers got its famous re-release in the 70s. I mean, a lot of us don't know this story. I consider myself to be kind of a Marx aficionado, and I didn't know it. Well, I hear from a lot of people today that don't understand why wasn't the film out, because I explained to them that Universal had the rights to the film because they had purchased the Paramount package of old films back in the 50s, and there was a, a legal snag in the rights and Universal didn't feel that it was worth spending the money to untangle and then strike new prints and re-release the film. They would rather focus on their current crop of films like Airport 75. <laughs> so people today are saying, how could they not understand? This was the lost arc. This was the missing link in the Marx Brothers canon. It was their second film. It was Groucho as Captain Spaulding. And I have to say... You know, you have to understand, in 74, it was just this old movie that Universal saw no potential in. But if only for the sake of my friends who were all diehard Marx Brothers fans, I thought that maybe there is some way we can convince Universal to put the film out again and try it out and see how it does. And I started a petition drive when I was at, at uh, UCLA we were the envy of all the other petition drives, uh, gay rights and legalized marijuana. People people were reticent about signing any kind of petition, and then they'd get to ours, and I don't understand. This is about an old movie? Yes. You have to be a registered voter? No. Is the FBI going to get it? No. And you had a, a famous, or the scion of a famous person, sign one of the petitions, right? Yes. One of the uh, Watergate uh, <laughs> figures, his son was attending uh, Haldeman. H.R. Haldeman, Jr. Yes. <laughs> I wonder if people say, are you related to H.R. Haldeman? <laughs> no, I'm just H.R. Haldeman, Jr. My parents were sadistic. But that was been a remarkable time, though, to have something that almost everybody probably agreed on. Everybody agreed on it except Universal, <laughs> who thought there's no money in it. And so when, when the film did get re-released, it had two re-premieres, one in Westwood and one in New York, the one in Westwood was at the United Artists Westwood Theater, and it broke the record that had been set by the French Connection several years earlier. Also, too, you mentioned in the book that as well as the movie did in Los Angeles when it premiered in New York, there was almost a riot. Yes, Groucho uh, was almost trampled by the crowds in New York, which, I mean, the upside of that is how flattering that that many people cared. The downside is he was frail and in his mid-80s, and uh, apparently it was kind of touch-and-go there for a while. But by the, by the early 70s, the, the, uh, the baby boomers had embraced the anarchy of the Marx Brothers. It started in the late 60s, and then by the early 70s was in full blossom because, of, you know, all that anti-establishment, anti-authority stuff really appealed to the baby boomers, and so Groucho was writing this new crest of popularity after having sort of fallen into semi-obscurity in the mid-60s after You Bet Your Life went off the air. But also, in that same way that Bogart became a new icon in the late 60s, early 70s, Groucho was also, in effect, an anti-hero, too, and that must have made him beloved by that generation as well. Yes, and there were certain classic comedians, Mae West, W.C. Fields, and the Marx Brothers, and I think it was because they were sassy and no-nonsense and, as you said, more anti-heroes than heroic figures, and people rediscovered this wonderful gold that had been collecting dust for decades. Whatever he's for, I'm against it. It's the treatment. My guest is Steve Stellier. His book on his time with Groucho Marx is Raised Eyebrows, and through that experience getting Animal Crackers back out, you got to meet with somebody who was both good to you and cast a big shadow over your life. I was a colossal Groucho fan through high school and into college, 
and I thought all I wanted was just to shake his hand and thank him for duck soup and for all the laughs. But I knew that he was old and frail, and I thought there is absolutely no chance I'll ever be able to meet him. And through this extraordinary set of circumstances, he came to UCLA, and we sat side by side, not unlike what we're doing right now, and uh, chatted with the news people about animal crackers, and, and it was just electrifying to be in the company of my hero. And so I contacted the woman who was in charge of Groucho's life, Erin Fleming, and I said, is there anything at all that I could do that you need someone to do? And she said, well, we I was Groucho's secretary for several years, but now I'm his manager, and we really do need someone to handle the fan mail and to organize all of his memorabilia for donation to the Smithsonian after he's gone. And I think I was over there while she was still on the phone. Could you tell a story I, about getting over there, too, and hearing that he had just had a stroke? Well, that was uh, a few weeks into working there. Initially, you know, I thought I was going to be working maybe at some office building on Wilshire and maybe Groucho would come in once a month to sign checks or something. And Aaron said, oh, no, dear, you'll be working right in his house and you can make your own hours. And initially I thought that, you know, all right, I'll work six days a week and rest on Sunday. So I worked a full week and then was home on Sunday thinking, why am I sitting here? Why do I need a day off from this? And and showered and got dressed and drove back. And it was like I needed to just immerse myself in this experience. And several weeks in, I had uh, gotten comfortable finally being a part of the household. And I thought, uh, this is just amazing, and I hope it lasts and lasts. And I got there one day, and uh, the the maid opened the door and said, please be quiet, Mr. Marks has had a stroke and I thought, oh, God, no, it's all going to evaporate now. This thing that I've cherished is only going to last a few weeks. And so I went back where he was in his bedroom expecting to see him, you know, lying on his bed, semi-conscious or in a coma or something. And, and he's propped up in bed in his pajamas with his beret and his mucklucks reading the paper. And he looks at me and he says... Is the ambulance here yet? And I said, no. And he just, that figures. Gets, goes back to his, it's like, yeah, another stroke, fine. So I was the only one that was really super concerned because to me the word stroke meant, oh, no, he'll never be the same again. I mean, even when I met him, I said, Groucho, I'm so glad to meet you after all these years. And he said, well, you should be. As am I. It's the treatment, which you can also hear at KCRW.com. My guest, who does a terrific elderly Groucho Marx, is Steve Stolyer. His book has raised eyebrows about his years inside Groucho's house. And given that sort of high and low you just put into that one story, that the years you worked there were about a series of highs and lows, starting with Aaron Fleming, who brought you into the house. Yes, it was, it was a real best of times, worst of times. As it turned out, what I thought was going to be the end of my job was only the beginning, because that was about three weeks in, and I ended up working for him the last three years of his life. I was the longest surviving employee as uh, other staff members, nurses, maids, cooks came and went. Aaron would hire and lop off their heads. I mean, I was only 19 when I got the job and did not have experience dealing with people with difficult personalities. But somehow I managed to strike a balance where I never upset her to the point where she said, we don't need you anymore, and I wanted to be near my hero. So, yes, it was, I mean, it was such a kaleidoscope of spending comfortable time with Groucho plus his brothers Zeppo and Gummo plus... George Burns and Bob Hope and Mae West and You SJ. talk about that dynamism of George Burns when he came into the house. Oh, it was great. I, this was right before the Sunshine Boys. At the time, his, his best friend, Jack Benny, was in rehearsals for the role opposite Walter Matthau, and only when Jack Benny died did George Burns take over, which led to the whole renaissance of interest in George Burns. But he was invited to lunch one day, and I got the door, and I was nervous. And he walks in, and he goes, Hi, you want to be an old man? 
Become an actor. You'll live to be an old man like Groucho and me. Okay, let's eat. And he sat down, and, and then, like the two of them, uh, it really it would have reminded me of the Sunshine Boys had the film existed yet. But they were, you know, they would argue about, you know, no, the theater was on 16th Street because it was next to that drugstore with the woman that had the daughter. No, Groucho, that was in Chicago. And uh, at the end of lunch, Burns lit up a cigar and puffed on it and said, Milton Burrow pays $2 for a cigar. If I paid that much, I'd go to bed with it before I'd smoke it. <laughs> I have to say, too, that in what must seem like weirdly poetic justice, when you met Erin and you didn't have a car and had to borrow your parents' car, the car she sold you almost feel like a metaphor for the way she lived her life. Well, the car she sold me was a Pinto, <laughs> which at the time were not known to be the mobile Molotov cocktails that they they came to become. Uh, and I was thrilled that she sold me her. It was it was a car that Groucho had bought for her, and the license plate was N I R E, which was Aaron backwards. Although she probably read it as frontwards. And uh, and since she had gotten a Mercedes 450 SL, didn't really need the Pinto, so she sold it to me. But you tell a story in the book about initially driving Groucho around for a while and being a little nervous because you did have pretty delicate cargo. Well, there. speaking of, of mobile Molotov cocktails, I felt like I had a five foot seven bottle of nitroglycerin on the passenger seat because, you know, he was he was still Groucho, but he was old and frail and he had had a heart attack and a and a stroke and I thought all I need to do is get into a fender bender or take my eyes off the road or something. You know, the responsibility of trying to focus on driving and parking with Groucho Marx at, you know, 86 or so sitting next to me. You know, once I got past the idea that this was Groucho Marx himself, realizing that he was someone who personally knew George Gershwin and Irving Berlin and George Kaufman and W.C. Fields and all these mythical figures. And, you know, and Groucho's circle of friends, Nat Perrin, who worked on Monkey Business and Duck Soup. And Nat told me that when he was young, he said, I snuck into the, e this is, by the way, a dead on Nat Perrin impression. I need to tell you that because no one else knows. I snuck into Aeolian Hall the night Gershwin premiered Rhapsody in Blue. And a lot of people had left because it was hot and it was at the end of a long program. But I was such a Gershwin fan. I sat there. And so he, it's like here is this guy who was there to hear the first performance of Rhapsody in Blue. And then he told me, he said, after I came to Hollywood, I was at a party with Groucho and Gershwin was there. And Groucho drags me over and says, George... This is Nat Perrin. He's the only person I know that can whistle the entire Rhapsody in Blue. But luckily, he didn't make me do it because it would have been like 17 minutes of whistling. Well, at that point, we're going to take a break and give the audience a chance to collect themselves from that dead-on Nat Perrin impression. I guess it's Steve Stelger. He's the author of the terrific memoir, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House. It's a treatment. It's more to come. Stay with us. You're listening to The Treatment with Elvis Mitchell from the studios of KCRW Santa Monica. I'm Jenny Radelet, producer of The Treatment. If you like our show, you might also like The Business, KCRW's show about the business of show business, hosted by Kim Masters of The Hollywood Reporter. Find it on iTunes or on KCRW's smartphone apps. Welcome back. It's The Treatment, which you can also hear at kcrw.com. You can get Steve Stolyer's terrific book, Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, at amazon.com, and many other places online find it because it's a fascinating book. I guess I find myself thinking, with all that drama that was going on between Aaron Fleming and the Marx children um, for the estate and also the, the, the kind of havoc she was wreaking on Groucho's psyche, what was it like to go home from all that? I mean, how much time did it take you to decompress and get back to work again? Because you don't really talk about dreading going to work, but at a certain point, it must have been just kind of a perch between heaven and hell for you. 
Well, I never really dreaded going there. I, I made up my mind early on when I saw how difficult Erin could be. Uh, I mean, she was mercurial. She would fly off the handle and have raging, screaming, slamming her fist and slamming of doors. And she was she was definitely verbally and emotionally abusive to Groucho. Which she would do we, some to tears many times, it, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, and it hurt to see that. And there are people now who say, well, why didn't you do something? Or, you know, why didn't you tell his son? Or why? And it's like, you know, the color of truth is gray. You're not dealing with heroes and villains because Groucho's children had sort of turned their backs on Groucho because they had other priorities. And Aaron had come along at a time when Groucho was just kind of sitting alone in this big Beverly Hills house. His last wife had left him, and she picked him up and dusted him off, for better or for worse, because she also put him under the glare of that harsh spotlight, but introduced him to a lot of new fans. So I thought, I, I still want to be hanging around here, because it's still fascinating, but it was very stressful, because there were these two factions, and I sort of fell in between because Arthur Marx was Groucho's only son, and he viewed me as part of the Aaron camp because she had hired me. And then once I had given my deposition during the conservatorship battle for Groucho, Aaron saw that I did not feel any obligation to go out of my way to whitewash her, her mercurial personality and the way she treated Groucho. And in fact, I ended up as a sort of traffic cop Nat Perrin, who was the interim conservator, had me living at the house on weekends as a sort of traffic cop between the, the friends of the two different factions to make sure they didn't bump into each other. It's the treatment I'm talking to Steve Stolier about his book, Raised Eyebrows, His Years Inside Groucho's House, which you can find, of course, on Amazon.com, other places online. You can also see the show at KCRW.com. I guess what I'm wondering, too, though, is when you started to write the book, what it was like to revisit all of that stuff, especially that last year when all of the battles for the estate started to make the paper, there was such tumult. Was it tough for you to go back and, and, and start to work on the book? It was a strange experience. For years, people had said, uh, you know, you ought to write a book about this. And I thought, you know, my, I was such a, a footnote to his life. It would have been ridiculous to try to get a book out of this. And then but you're I also so solicitous of him, clearly, as you say in the book. It must have been tough for you to come to that decision to write the book. Yes, I didn't want to, to uh, have him become uh, uh, the object of pity. I didn't want to paint a portrait of... Uh, like a pathetic, faded icon. On the other hand, I didn't want to whitewash it and be guilty of the same things that I resented the press for at the time, saying it, Groucho at 85, still just as sharp as ever. And then, you know, when I did see him, realizing that that wasn't entirely true, but that there was always, I mean, even as as frail as he got, he remained Groucho to the end, and there were, it was always delightful when he'd twist a line and hand it back to me. He used to love when I'd bring him the mail because he, he subscribed to the Hollywood trade papers, and he came to the lunch table once and he said, wonderful mail today, nothing but requests for money. And I said, you got a variety, didn't you? And he said, yes, a variety of requests for money. And I thought, he, he phrased that exactly as he would have at any point. Well, yeah, was, was, at certain points, you must have been almost... Like you were standing outside of yourself watching this thing happen to I Steve never, Stolia. I never lost sight of the fact how lucky I was. And when I would see the vans go by and stop, I would sometimes wave from the kitchen window thinking, let those people go back to Minnesota and think, I saw someone waving. I'm not sure, but I think it might have been Groucho. I never lost sight of that. But putting the book together, uh, I sort of went through that whole transformation from naive Groucho fanatic to sort of a more cynical, wiser, in a compressed period of time by putting putting the book in chronological order, I found myself going through all of it all over again. And then in the new edition, which Bear Manor Media published, I penned an afterward chapter about the things that have happened to the various people in the book since the book came out, including when, sure. when I went back 
to what has become of Groucho's house, which was a surreal experience. What was that like? I felt like Rod Taylor in the time machine, that I, I was inhabiting the same space but in a different time because the, so the house had been so completely reconfigured that it, it only bore faint traces. I felt like some blind psychic tour guide walking along the hallway saying, my bedroom was over here and, that, and there'd be a wall there. And I'd say, and, and Aaron's bathroom was here and there'd be a hallway there. I mean, it, it was completely reworked. They, they even moved the pool slightly closer to the living room, which I don't understand. And I guess you talk about what became of Aaron Fleming as well. Uh, actually, I mean, what happened to her is a sad thing because at, at the end of the initial book, she's essentially a homeless, unbalanced woman. She was literally schizophrenic, and it only worsened after Groucho died, and, and she ended up in a series of assisted living facilities. And she, she also lost the conservatorship of the estate. She lost the conservatorship, and then after Groucho died, she was sued by Groucho's son Arthur and the Bank of America for having bilked Groucho out of money. Almost half a million and, dollars. Yeah. And, and again, it's one of those things where if Groucho was around, he would have said, I wanted to have those things. So you're dealing with, again, you're not dealing with good and bad and heroes and villains. It's all different shades of gray. It's the treatment, which you can also hear at KCRW.com. My guest is Steve Stolier. His book has raised eyebrows. My years inside Groucho's house. You talked about when she saw the book, you were telling me this, her response to it, which kind of defined, as you said someone said to you, uh, a schizophrenic reaction. Well, because Aaron was given to fits of fury over the slightest sideways glance or way someone phrased something, she could just turn into Cruella de Vil. Did you ever get a sense, by the way, of when these things would happen, just whether it be some sort of shift in her expression, or would they really just come out of nowhere, these explosions, these paroxysms, anger? Yeah, it was, it was you know, remarkable and kind of scary, because we never knew what was going to be that, you know, emotional landmine we were going to step on that was going to set her off. So I finally uh, found out from someone who knew her and at least corresponded with her and spoke with her on the phone like once a year. He said, she read your book. And it's like I steadied myself for this atomic blast. I said, all right, what did she say? She said, there's a mistake on every page. And the Pinto that she sold me wasn't $1,500. It was $1,200. And that was it. So... You know, I later found out that that was a classic response for a schizophrenic to focus on something microscopic and completely miss the big picture. But part of this thing I wonder about, too, as I was reading the book was, given that she was at one point an aspiring actress, was she a charismatic figure in person? I mean, could you see what it was about her that brought Groucho to her? She did have presence, and that personality did light up a room. You just weren't sure if it was, you know, the light of brilliance or like an electric chair. So it was like one of those, are you going to cut the blue wire or the red wire situations? So she would just cut the purple wire and split <laughs> the difference. <laughs> but it just makes me wonder because there must have been also some kind of chemistry between Aaron and Groucho as well. You well, that's the thing. That. That's the thing that's hard. People come to me and they say, I hear so many conflicting things about her. Was she this this woman that devoted herself to him and was by his side and doted on him? Yes. Was she this woman who screamed at him till he cried and alienated his old-time friends and family? Yes. Was she this ambitious woman that was just using him to try to further? Yes. Was she there when no one else was there? Yes. It's just like... Whatever you've heard, chances are, is probably true to some degree. So when she came along, she just initially started out as his secretary. And as he got weaker, he grew more dependent on her, and that sort of fed her megalomania. So it was a very volatile dynamic between them. But yes, he was... I don't think there was anything physical between them, and I've never talked to anyone in the know who really ever thought, you know, people say, oh, yeah, he had that you, girlfriend. You talk about that in the book, the difference between him and people like John Barron and the others who ended up marrying their younger companions. Yes, uh, W.C. Fields with Carlotta Monti and Lugosi. Lugosi with his last wife and John Barrymore with Elaine Barry where they ended up 
marrying and being taken in by these ambitious women who were in love with the earlier versions. She never she never married Groucho. And was, in fact, dismissive of people who tried to paint an amorous picture between the two of them. Yes. I mean, Groucho would kid about it if you see, the like, the Dick Cavett DVDs, and he'll talk about, you know, and this is my secretary, and that's in, in quotes, secretary. But, in fact, that's that's what she was. Uh, and he was very fond of her, and she really could get him to perk up and, you know, be more on when he was on a TV show or giving a performance or something. But at the expense of, you know, there were close friends of his that felt like, why did she expose him to such a harsh spotlight? Why couldn't his last years be smoother than they were? Did she? Could she see, do you think, what she was doing to him? Could she see how frail he was as she was pushing him into this last TV special? You, you talk about her wanting to do with him. He was obviously way too old and infirm to even think about doing. I don't think she ever accepted the fact that he was, above all, a human being in frail condition in his late 80s. You know, people would bring things to her attention and she would just shrug them off and say, oh, well, so if he's having a bad day, I'm sure he'll be fine. And we would all be exchanging glances thinking, he can't do a TV special. How can she possibly? And, you know, the answer was, well, she's going to be a producer on it and she really wants to have that credit under her belt. I, I, the feeling I got from the book was that him succeeding was important to her as well because she was pushing him towards something. I mean, there was this peculiar, deluded belief in Groucho Marx and capital letters. Right. Well, that doesn't make much sense, but you'll understand. He died a living legend, partly because of her efforts, although I hasten to add that, as I say, that crest of popularity that that wave was already swelling before she came on the scene in the in the late 60s when the Smothers Brothers and David Steinberg and Dick Cavett embraced him uh, and the whole baby boomer generation. But she did help mold that, that renaissance of interest in Groucho and the Marx Brothers, but also put him under a, a harsh light and, uh, and, and angered and alienated people who really cared about him. Well, it's a fascinating book, and Steve, thanks so much for coming by to talk about it. My pleasure. My guest is Steve Stollier. His book is Raised Eyebrows, My Years Inside Groucho's House, a look at the three years he spent working for Groucho Marx before the end of his life. It's a terrific book. Please go out and find it wherever you can. A recording engineer at KCRW in Santa Monica is Ray Guarna. The show is mixed and edited by J.C. Swadek. It is produced by Jenny Radelet. I'm Elvis Mitchell. Say the secret word. It's the treatment. Find past episodes of The Treatment at kcrw.com or subscribe to the podcast on iTunes. Listen to The Treatment on demand on your smartphone with KCRW's apps. The Treatment is produced and distributed by KCRW Santa Monica. That don't